Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 14.5 on more organic reactions. In the previous lesson we talked about addition, esterification, and substitution reactions. We're going to pick up that discussion today and we're going to cover three more types of organic reactions. To be perfectly honest, uh, I think the three reactions that we talk about today are definitely a lot easier to contend with than the three that we tackled in the previous lesson. All right, so new chemists, most people's favorite type of organic reaction, we've got combustion. We've talked about combustion before. It is when you burn something, uh, usually the thing that you're burning is a hydrocarbon. And you might remember in a combustion reaction, one of the reactants has to be oxygen. Um, so this is going to be a very fast, very exothermic reaction. And once we're out of oxygen or we're out of our hydrocarbon, the thing that's being burned, the reaction is going to stop. We're going to get into a little bit more detail. It turns out there are two different types of combustion. They are very, very similar, uh, but there is a subtle and important difference. When oxygen is in excess, so generally speaking, if you're burning something out in the open air, like a piece of paper, um, you have plenty of O2 to go around. Uh, this is the type of, react, uh, type of combustion reactions that we've studied earlier this year. We know when we take a hydrocarbon, again, something which is carbon and hydrogen in its structure and formula, and combine it with oxygen, we're going to produce water and carbon dioxide. Now, the coefficients of all of these substances really depends on the reaction itself, but we predictably get the same two products. We call this complete combustion. The hydrogen and the carbon atoms and the hydrocarbon have reacted with as much oxygen as they possibly can. So they've completely oxidized, I guess is a good way to think about that. We can have O2 in a limited situation. If O2 is limited, it's going to change one of our products. Take an educated guess on which product is going to change. Well, it definitely can't be water. Um, if you don't have enough oxygen to go around, you're not just going to make hydroxide ions or hydroxyl groups. Those can't exist on their own. So it's going to have to be carbon dioxide that goes through a change. When oxygen is limited, instead of forming carbon dioxide, what do you think we might form? If you're thinking carbon monoxide, you're absolutely, uh, absolutely correct. We call this incomplete combustion. Our carbon is not as oxidized as it can be. Um, incomplete combustion is definitely more dangerous from a health perspective than complete combustion. Um, obviously know that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and contributes to uh, global climate change. Uh, but your immediate impact on your health is not going to be dramatically jeopardized by small amounts of CO2. However, your immediate health can be very jeopardized by even small amounts of just carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide has a molecular structure like this. Ooh, not with that big spike. We have a carbon atom and an oxygen atom triple bonded together, and this is a pretty highly polarized, uh, highly polarized bond. We have formal charges on the oxygen and the carbon. Um, this molecule is going to bind more tightly to the hemoglobin in your red blood cells than oxygen can. So if you are exposed to carbon monoxide and you're breathing it in, it's going to displace the oxygen that your red blood cells are supposed to be trapping and carrying around your body. Um, and instead, they're going to be transporting carbon monoxide. Uh, your body doesn't need carbon monoxide, so you essentially suffocate. If you come across somebody who you fear has suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, you want to get them to fresh air immediately. Uh, by taking them to fresh air, not only do you get away from the source of carbon monoxide, but as they continue breathing, assuming they're still breathing, um, they're going to breathe in the oxygen and eventually the reversible reaction um, or the binding of the carbon monoxide onto the hemoglobin is going to be pushed in the opposite direction. You'll unbind the carbon monoxide and you'll get that person oxygen. Uh, you don't want to burn things in small enclosed spaces uh, because as your O2 starts to run out, you're going to be creating a higher percentage of carbon monoxide than carbon dioxide, and this could be potentially very dangerous. 
All right, uh, fermentation is a reaction you probably won't care too much about until you're 21. Can you guess what one of the products are? It is ethanol, and the process of fermentation is actually very, very gross. Uh, the products, no, those are great, but the process, probably something you don't want to watch. Um, in fermentation, it's more of a biological process than a chemical one. But yeast, which are just bacteria, are going to break down sugars into carbon dioxide and ethanol. Um, if you have made bread from scratch before, you might have used yeast. Uh, yeast is usually sold kind of like in um, like dry packets. And then as the yeast becomes activated, a lot of times it just requires something like water, um, they're going to start to break down sugar. And in the process, they're going to produce bubbles. And it's, it's just kind of gross when you think about it that carbon dioxide and ethanol are the waste products products of yeast eating. Fermentation is a really easy reaction to pick out as it's the only one that has yeast over the reaction arrow. We're always going to start with some sugar. Um, a lot of times we're just going to use glucose. Hopefully that's a formula you're familiar with between chemistry and biology, C6H12O6. And the yeast are going to act upon it and they're going to break down your glucose into ethanol and carbon dioxide. That's where all the bubbles come from. Uh, depending on where you get your sugar source, you'll get different types of alcohols. For example, if you are fermenting grapes, what do you probably make? In most cases, oops, you can make wine. Um, if you're fermenting things like uh, barley or hops, you're gonna get beer, potatoes, usually associated with vodka. And uh, what about like the agave plant? Agave will give you tequila. Uh, in reality, you know, all different types of alcohols are made from different starting materials nowadays and kind of how you age it and process it and treat it uh, can change the flavoring. Uh, but traditionally, those are the type of alcohols that were produced from those starting materials. All right, the last one we're gonna talk about today is saponification. If you rearrange the first four letters of this reaction name, you can figure out what one of the products is going to be. Yeah, this is how you make soap. Another pretty disgusting process when you get down to it. In saponification, uh, we're going to take fatty acids, or just fats, and we're going to react them with a very strong, very concentrated base, something like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Uh, yeah, you can take things like bacon grease, for example, um, vegetable oil, coconut oil, something like that, and if you react it with a strong base, you can make yourself a very, very crude soap. If you're expecting some fancy Bath and Body Works stuff, you are going to be very disappointed, but in a pinch you can make soap. Uh, so the way this works is we're going to take a fat. A uh, fat is really just a long hydrocarbon chain. Uh, we have these, you might recognize them from yesterday's lesson, an ester linkage. Um, this is just an example of a fat. You don't have to memorize that formula, you can just remember fat. Hopefully that's pretty easy. We're going to react it with a lot of uh, strong base. So in the example, I've got sodium hydroxide. Again, potassium hydroxide can be used. I probably am not going to put that over the reaction arrow if I'm asking you to classify this reaction. That's just a little bit too much of a giveaway. We're going to produce glycerol, which is a fun precursor to things like... Um, uh, you can treat it with um, nitric and sulfuric acids, and you can make nitroglycerin, which is very, very reactive and very explosive. Uh, but the part that we're most interested in is this crude soap. Uh, so it's this very crude soap that we're interested in. And again, you do not have to know the formula um, as far as the specifics of what does the crude soap look like. If you're okay with fat plus base yields glycerol plus soap, I'm pretty happy. I'd like to finish up today's lesson uh, just kind of by recapping the six different reaction types that we learned. Uh, we talked about addition, substitution, and esterification in the um, screencast 14.4. And then today we looked at combustion, fermentation, and saponification. One thing that proves to be hard for new chemists to do is classify reactions. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video and think about it for a couple of minutes. What type of hints or clues can you look at for in the products or the reactants uh, to help you classify all six of the organic reactions?
Ooh, forgot the S. <laughs> organic reactions that we've looked at so far. So pause the video, uh, try them out, and I'm going to get them up here so you can check. Let's check out and see how you did. In an addition reaction, you're looking for an unsaturated hydrocarbon. You need an alkane or alkene present. Uh, sorry, an alkene or an alkyne present. Misspoke there. Um, double or triple bonds need to be in the hydrocarbon, otherwise this reaction can't take place. Typically, we're going to be reacting our unsaturated hydrocarbon with a halogen, that's a group 17 diatomic molecule, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, or with H2. A lot of students confuse addition and substitution. They're very similar. Both call for a hydrocarbon plus a halogen, but in a substitution reaction, you need a saturated hydrocarbon. It only works with alkanes. We're going to substitute out one hydrogen on the hydrocarbon at a time, um, and you really don't know what one. It's going to be random. Esterification, uh, probably, at least in my opinion anyway, the most complicated of all the reactions we've talked about. Esterification, we need functional groups that have hydroxyls present. So that is going to, 99% of the time for us, mean we're going to react an alcohol with an organic acid. And we'll produce our ester and water. Combustion reactions are usually pretty easy for students to pick out, just because we've talked about them before. In a combustion, we need O2 to be one of the reactants. We're going to react that with a hydrocarbon um, and produce lots of energy very quickly. Fermentation, I think personally another really easy one to pick out. It's the only reaction where you have yeast present. Uh, sometimes you'll see the word zymase instead. New York State gets all fancy and wants to put the enzyme that is responsible for breaking down the sugar and not just yeast. And finally, saponification. Don't stress out too much about the formulas uh, or the structural formulas, I should say, of the fat and the products. Just know that a fat plus a strong base, that's going to lead to saponification and we're going to produce a very crude soap and glycerol. Uh, there are a ton of practice problems, as always, um, that mix up those six different reaction types. I highly recommend going through, trying them out, practicing. Um, see if by you know the end of this um, set of practice problems, you can start weaning yourself off of constantly flipping back into your notes um, and seeing what the products are supposed to be or how to classify the reaction. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you found this helpful.